Straight Shift. With the Car Chick, the podcast that's all about cars, buying, selling, fixing, and driving. And sometimes pretty fast if you're the Car Chick. Now, here she is. Welcome, everyone, to the Straight Shift. Today, we're going to talk about negotiating, and I have a very special guest. When I started my car buying company, we did it because we saw how uncomfortable women especially tended to be when negotiating for a car. And a little market research showed that women, on average, pay a thousand dollars more for the same car than men do. And it's because they're uncomfortable with the negotiating process. And you know, years ago when I started this company, I really wanted to understand why were they so uncomfortable with negotiating? Did they just not feel comfortable with the dealership processes? I knew they didn't feel comfortable a lot of the time with the way they perceived the dealers were treating them versus the way they would treat them when brought a man with them. But I wanted to know, was there something more about negotiating that women were just more uncomfortable with it on average than men? Now, obviously, this doesn't apply to every woman. I have many clients for whom the wife is the much stronger negotiator and the husband brings her along to buy a car. But industry data shows that this tends to be more of a problem area for women. So in my research, I stumbled across this amazing book called Women Don't Ask, The High Cost of Avoiding Negotiation and Positive Strategies for Change. And I am deeply honored to have one of the authors of this book, Sara Lechevre. She is an author and editor and an overall cultural critic and social scientist. And she's written a lot of articles and books about women's life and career obstacles. And she lectures and teaches all all over the world about this. So, Sarah, I am so honored that you decided to come on my little podcast. You know, it's delightful to be here. Uh, car buying is one of those flashpoints for a lot of women, really stressful. And of course, it's a lot of money. It's a big purchase and you'll be living with it for a long time. So it makes sense that we should have strong feelings about it, but it also makes sense to not overpay. Exactly. And we pay too much for so many things as women, you know, from haircuts to everything else. Mm-hmm. But before we get into the science behind negotiating and women's challenges, what you and your co author, uh, Linda Babcock, who I believe is an economist, correct? Yeah, she's a behavioral economist. That's amazing. I have an economics degree mm-hmm. from college. And I don't think I've ever used it. But <laughs> what? got you guys interested in this topic and why did you write that first book? Well, I have always been interested in women's careers and the ways in which our careers, my generation's careers and those of, you know, my children's generation differ so much from the lives of our mothers and women who went before us. And so I've written a lot about, you know, women's lives and how our trajectories are not just different from those of our mothers, but different from those of our male peers, and in many cases, just idiosyncratic and distinctive because our lives are complicated. And I actually grew up with a father who, one of his mantras, one of the things he said to all four of his kids, and uh, I'm one of four, two girls, two boys, was, don't take no for an answer the first three times. Um, it's not, uh, no doesn't always mean no, and in fact, in many cases, it doesn't. So that was you know, an early negotiation piece of advice from my dad. And then, you know, a number of years ago, Linda Babcock, who is, as I said, a behavioral economist at Carnegie Mellon, uh, very interested in negotiation, conflict resolution, and women. And she was a visiting professor at the Harvard Business School, and I live in the Cambridge area. And she had had this, uh, this insight that made this observation about her graduate students, that the Men would come and ask for something that could help their careers get ahead. They'd ask for funding to go to a big policy conference. They'd ask for an opportunity to teach their own courses, something that could be good for their careers. <laughs> Excuse me. And the women would find out and come and say, well, why'd you give it to him? Why didn't you give that to me? And Linda began to notice this pattern that the men would ask and the women would not ask. 
and that the difference could make a real difference, you know, could really have an impact on their future careers. And so she wondered, was this a weird quirk of Carnegie Mellon or the Heinz College where she taught at Carnegie Mellon, or was it more widespread? So she looked into it, and there wasn't a lot of research about this, whether there was a difference between how often men and women ask for things for themselves and, you know, any of the nuances of that phenomenon. So when she was at the Harvard Business School that year, she ran into a uh, whatever, a literary uh, agent at a cocktail party was talking about this idea and the woman thought there might be a book there. So she asked around wow. for looking for a writer who'd written a lot about women's careers and we met. And of course, my father's early advice made me really open to the topic. And so we decided to write this book together. And she was I love yeah. that you were influenced by yeah, your father. Yeah. I was too. My dad taught me two really important things. We used to travel a lot when I was a kid and we would go to, you know, the Caribbean and and Mexico and Africa. And he taught me how to negotiate in the marketplaces there. And the one piece of advice that he gave me that has stuck with me, I'm an only child. And he told me, don't ever let anyone tell you, you can't do something just because you're a girl. And between that and the negotiating training he gave me, that's carried me a lot into my career, both my former life in corporate America, you know, and now as an entrepreneur. So I love that your dad influenced you too. Yeah, he uh, he was a strong personality, and he sent all his kids to private colleges and was a big booster of all of us. That's wonderful. So let's talk about, you know, why women are less comfortable with negotiating. You know, one thing that I have seen over the years in the car business is that women, when we spend time with someone or when someone spends time with us, like a car salesperson who spends time with us on a test drive and gives us all that information, sometimes we feel guilty about walking away if the numbers don't come together because we we feel guilty, like, oh, this person spent time with us. I should really give them my business. Whereas men are like, hey, you know, nice talking to you, but numbers aren't good. I'm out of here. <laughs> well, I think what? that, yeah, that uh, carries... Uh, Um, across a lot of domains of women's lives that we worry about the other side. We're heavily socialized as children to be what social scientists call communal, to take care of the community, to take care of other people. And so we do worry about, uh, you know, whoever's on the other side of the table, will this be hard for them? Will they get in trouble? Will they be disappointed? And so we essentially kind of negotiate their side of, of the deal for them, or we worry that walking away will somehow hurt their feelings or, Um, you know, damage the relationship. And in a work situation, you know, there is a relationship you do need to keep in mind. But when you're negotiating with a car salesman or someone in a, you know, a Turkish bazaar or at an antique fair, and you're never going to see them again, it's, uh, it doesn't make sense to worry too much about them. In their view, it's business. And actually walking away can be a very good negotiating tactic because they might run after you and say, actually, I can do a little better. And that's really one of the biggest negotiating tactics that people can use in the car business, you know, because they are there at the dealership and getting up and walking away from the table is usually their most powerful tool. I'm lucky because I have a little bit of a different world and a different relationship, but believe me, I walk away from the table too. So why are we like this? Why do we... We want to care about other people more than ourselves. Well, they're, uh, you know, we're very heavily socialized as kids. We're socialized uh, by the toys that we're given. Girls are much more frequently given toys that involve taking care of other people, baby dolls, tea sets, kitchen equipment, things that are focused on caretaking, where boys are given toys that are focused on setting goals for themselves and making them happen, building a train set. I want the, you know, the tracks to go through this tunnel, split here, go over this bridge, reconnect. I want this building toy to function this way. Um, So there's a lot of interesting research on the impact of the toys kids are given and how adults are uncomfortable when kids play with toys that are not, you know, what we consider to be gender appropriate. There are, we get a lot of messages from the chores we're given. We get a lot of messages from the fact that, um, we, you know, we don't like girls that 
you feel are too aggressive, too pushy, too demanding, too selfish, greedy, whatever. And girls see that adults and other kids don't respond well when they advocate for themselves in what might be perceived as an aggressive way. And so we hold back. Um, you know, yeah. I experienced that yeah. so much in corporate America, you know, where, you know, I'm obviously a strong personality and, you know, growing up, yeah, I, I would be called bossy or when I got into corporate America, you know, we're called, and I'm just going to throw it out there, you know, we get called a bitch, whereas a guy simply gets called, you know, a leader, right. You know, that's not fair. <laughs> no, it's not fair, but it is an, it's a reality of our culture. It's not just men who don't like women they think are too aggressive, whatever that means. Other women also react badly to women they perceive to be too aggressive. And so we all reach adulthood thinking, well, that's not a good strategy because it's not going to get me what I want. Um and, you know, so we're like, all right, I'm going to be cautious. I'm going to be watchful. I'm going to worry about the other side and take care of people. And the problem is that taking care of yourself and your own needs sometimes gets uh, pushed into the background. Oh, in so many eras of our lives. <laughs> Although now I'm thinking I'm really glad that, you know, my parents got me Legos mm -hmm. and cars as toys as a child. I'm kind of seeing how I became the person I am today. But even I'm not immune to what you're talking about with the socialization of, you know, not making waves, not being too aggressive, which for me can be difficult. And I've actually been fired from jobs from stating my mind and being assertive where, you know, when the guy next to me did the exact same thing, he got a damn promotion yeah. and I got fired. Yeah. And unfortunately it's very common. I'm just, uh, you know, I've heard so, so, so many stories from women, uh, about this, uh, pro this problem. And they're actually consulting companies that are, you know, focus on teaching women to, lead in ways that aren't perceived as too bossy or whatever, too high maintenance. Um, I think there's one that was called, you know, bully boss or, you know, boss, boss lady. I'm not sure it still exists, but they were women who were, you know, super talented, but antagonizing people because they were acting in ways that, you know, seemed gender inappropriate were sent to these, these camps to be taught how to modulate their style so that they were more, uh, tolerable to their peers. Oh, I don't think I would have done well in one of those camps. Yeah. <laughs> well, you know, we talked about how, you know, when you don't negotiate the price of the car and, and all the areas of a car deal that you're going to leave money on the table and you're not going to, you're going to pay too much versus, you know, what my guy might do. But one of the things that really struck me in your book, Women Don't Ask, is in the negotiating of a salary right when you come out of college and the effect of if the woman doesn't negotiate, you know, even just a $2,000 higher starting salary, how that compounds over time and, you know, can cost her literally hundreds of thousands of dollars over her lifetime. That was what really terrified me. Yeah, those uh, those models are very dramatic uh, that, you know, even if you only refrain from negotiating this one time at the beginning of your career, and then you and somebody who did negotiate average the same annual increases, that small difference right at the beginning will add up to literally, you know, something like half a million dollars by the time you uh, retire. And that's you know, just not negotiating that one time. If the guy continually negotiates and you continually accept what you've been offered, accept what you've been offered, the difference is just, uh, you know, it's almost unquantifiable. It's so, it's so enormous. So yeah. That's you have to ask for raises very often. I mean, some companies will have a default raise or raise based on your performance, but a lot of companies, you know, you actually have to go to your boss and be like, hey, look at the value I've been providing. I deserve a raise. And I know so many women are not comfortable doing that. Or it's not, um, you know, I deserve a raise. It's I deserve a raise that's bigger than the minimum that everybody's getting. So if everybody's getting two and a half percent, but you brought in a huge client or lots of business or had a great year, you know, a man might say, hey, I had a great year. Can I have, you know, three and a half percent instead of two and a half percent this year? And a woman might think, well, it's what everybody else is getting. I guess that's fair. So there are lots of ways in which women accept what they're offered 
and men are more likely to raise their hands and say, uh, excuse me, can I, can I do a little better? So how can we stop sabotaging ourselves and, and be better negotiators and stand up for ourselves? Because frankly, we deserve it. Yeah. So, uh, you know, the first thing, and this is true of both car purchases and other negotiations, is you need to do your research. You need to find out what you should be asking for, because if you do not, women will aim too low. There's one uh, study that showed that men typically ask for 30% more than women do. That's a big difference. And they don't get 30% more, but a study showed that if you ask for 30% more, you have a pretty good chance of getting 10% more. And that 10%, again, can compound into a lot over, over you know, decades of a career. And that's something my dad taught me with the haggling in the marketplaces was you always, you know, make an offer that's, you know, way lower than realistically you're going to get because, the, you know, you got to have a starting place to then horse trade it and then find a place in the middle that is mutually agreeable and beneficial. Right. Now, you need to do your research and not ask for something that's ridiculous and off the charts and absurd because then they won't respect you. But you need to do your research and find out what the range is is and then aim for the top of the range. And as you said, you want to ask for more than you hope to get because they're going to push you down from wherever you start. Right. And that's that is literally my number one car buying rule is do your homework. So important. Absolutely. So what else what else can we do especially on the you know kind of emotional side of feeling guilty and and where do we go from there? Let's assuming we did our homework, what's the next step? Well, I guess I would say you've done your homework, you've decided what you want to ask for, you've decided what you want to aim for, and you should aim high. And then I would get together with somebody that you trust, a coworker, or a colleague, a family member, brief them thoroughly about the emotional things you're worried about, the flashpoints. If you think the other person's going to get angry or is going to you know, say something that embarrasses you or hurts your feelings or makes you angry or whatever, and then role play it. And role play calm responses that move things away from the conflict or the flashpoints towards a kind of joint problem solving, because that's what the best negotiations are. You have some things you want me to do. You have some things I'm bringing to the table. I want some things from you in return. Let's talk about it and reach an agreement that works for both of us. And that more problem solving approach has actually been shown decades of scholarship to produce better agreements for both sides. It's good for them too. So if you can practice saying, okay, obviously that's more than you think you can do, how close can you come? Or maybe you can meet me part way. Or best of all, can you explain to me why that seems so out of line? I'd really like to understand your point of view. And as people talk about why they think it's out of line or it's too much, you might be able to correct a misunderstanding. Or you might be able to say, actually, I don't think you're calculating in or factoring in X. Or "Hmm, maybe I haven't explained my proposal well enough. This is why I think it's worth it for you to give me what I'm asking for. Or maybe even, maybe you can't do it now, but could you do it in six months? And could we, could I get a commitment now to do it in six months or a year? So role play it. And there are a couple of benefits. One, of course, is you've decided what to say, you've planned and practiced what to say if what ha- what you're worried about happens. But also, if they trigger that emotion, you won't be surprised by it. And it turns out it's the surprise as much as the feeling itself that tends to derail us. You know, that makes so much sense. You know, we, we do a lot of this role playing in sales training to be able to overcome objections. And if you think about it, you know, closing a sale is a type of negotiation Absolutely. and a lot of the same emotions come up around that. Of course, I never thought about role playing haggling with a car dealer, but that's certainly a, an approach to, to get more comfortable before you go into the dealership and actually, you know, sit down at the desk with the salesperson. Absolutely. Especially if you feel a little, whatever, vulnerable, a little unsure, having, you know, a friend sit down and, you know, fire questions at you or discount what you're saying and practicing saying, well, actually I have done my research and what I just said is not off track. And here's, you know, here's my data. And that's another thing you can do is take your data with you. I just bought a car in September and I printed out stuff from Kelly Blue Book and True Car and whatever. And you know, this is what I want to get. And this, this is what the web is telling me is appropriate. 
And it's hard for them to say, oh, to discount all this available information out there. It is. And, you know, one of the challenges about car buying is that there is about 75% of the information that you need to negotiate a good deal on a new car is out there. It's the other 25% that's not there or that can be misleading that can throw people off. And that's where, you know, the dealer does have the advantage of having access to more information and more accurate information than the average consumer. But even coming in with that 75%, you're doing a lot better than the people that just walk in off the street. And that's why I say do do your homework and you know be aware that there's a lot more in play than is published or the information that is published is not always accurate. You know, I, I tell people all the time, Kelly Blue Book doesn't mean diddly squat, but it's a place to start and it's better than not having any information at all. Yeah, and I would say absolutely it feels hard you'd rather not but go to more than one dealership because different dealers will tell you different information and you will learn some stuff that you can't find on the web that is valuable and you'll you know whatever figure out who you want to do business with you'll get a sense of who really wants your business but just it is another way to collect information Absolutely. And, you know, it's kind of like getting a second opinion when, you know, your mechanic says your car needs something or your doctor says there's something wrong with you. If you get multiple opinions, you'll be able to see what's true and what may be some underlying BS. So obviously one of my other rules of car shopping is to shop around to a minimum of four dealers to make sure that you're getting the best deal. And, you know, sometimes you need to shop outside your geography. I recently bought a Mazda CX-5 for a client of mine down in Atlanta, and the inventory in Atlanta was a little bit low for the trim level she wanted, and the Atlanta dealers were just kind of being buttheads and didn't want to negotiate. And so I said, okay, no problem. So I called two of my dealers up here in Charlotte and you know, got another $3,000 off the deal and delivered free to Atlanta. So, you know, really expanding and shopping around even outside of your area can be beneficial because you'll get different information. So uh, I'm a big fan of that and I do it all the time. Well, and shop, uh, you know, shop around for the loan package that suits you best as well. If you leave it to, okay, I've decided I want this car. This is how much I'm going to pay. I think this is a good deal. And then you go in and meet with the financial guy and he says, well, I can get you the absolute best loan from whatever this credit union or that. You really want to be prepared to say, actually, that's not the best thing that's out there. You may be getting, uh, you know, a little kickback or a little payment for driving business to this to that uh, loan organization, but that's not going to be the best thing for me. Right. People need to secure their financing before they even go to the dealership. You know, get get a pre-approval in place at the bank that has the lowest rate for your credit. And then walk in with that and say, you know, hey, can you beat this? And a lot of the times the dealers can, and then that's great. Now you know, but you know what the best rates are for your credit profile. What other strategies can women use, you know, across life? Because the second book that you have is Ask For It, how women can use the power of negotiation to get what they really want. Um, Well, uh, you know, one of the things I recommend is just go out and negotiate a lot of stuff where the stakes are not that high. So you get comfortable with it and you realize a lot more things are negotiable than I thought they were. So say, there's a, you know, a boutique where you shop a lot. You like their stuff. There's something you wanted, a little more expensive than you want to pay. And you've gone in a couple of times. You see there's one your size still on the rack and the new season's merchandise has come in. Ask them if they'll give it to you for 25% off. You'd be surprised how they might not give you 25%, but they might give you 15% off. Um, if you're buying an air conditioner or something, you know, at, at one of the big box retailers, they're actually fairly receptive to people negotiating because they want you to buy the air conditioner from them rather than go down the road to whatever, Home Depot or, or Lowe's or, you know, whatever the alternative is. If you are, go, you know, going to the farmer's market and you want to buy tomatoes in bulk for canning, see if they'll give you a better deal than, you know, than they're quoting you. It's really great, <clears throat> excuse me, to realize a lot more things are 
negotiable than we think, but also you can observe what works well for you and what doesn't and where you sort of trip yourself up and try to, you know, think of ways to, to work around that or, or do things a little bit differently. I'm glad you mentioned the farmer's market because in one of my early videos that I did, one of the things I talk about is I think one of the reasons that we're less comfortable negotiating for cars is that cars are one of the few things that in the U.S., it is standard to negotiate the price. You know, we don't go to the market every day like they do in other countries and haggle over the price of beans and chickens and eggs and whatnot. You know, we go to Harris Teeter and, you know, you see what the green beans are for and you buy them when they're on sale. But when you get up to the checkout counter, you know, you don't haggle over the can of green beans. But in other cultures, day-to-day negotiating for everything is more standard than it is in America. That's absolutely true. Although there is this distinction, uh, which is that women actually are very good at negotiating when we're negotiating on behalf of our families, on behalf of people we supervise, on behalf of our patients or our students or our causes. Because as I said before, taking care of other people that's a gender norm for women. And we're pretty good at that. So even in those cultures where women are haggling at the at the market because it's on behalf of their families, they want to you know feed their kids well, when it comes to haggling or negotiating for themselves in, uh, in a workplace, they don't do as well because we're not as comfortable asking for ourselves. And we need to get over that because we're taking better care of ourselves is something that's going to benefit all of society. That's why they tell you on the airplane, put your own oxygen mask on first and then put it on your kid or anybody else around you. And as women, we're not good about putting our own oxygen masks on. And then next thing you know, we've been taking care of everybody else that we've run ourselves down. And we're quite frankly out of air. Well, there's another piece of it, which is, you know, we talk a lot about the wage gap. And uh, there's research from Goldman Sachs, a couple of other places, that if we closed the wage gap in this country, it would increase GDP by something like 9%. That's a, that statistic is a couple of years old, and I haven't checked it recently. But there are studies of uh, of this in a lot of countries where closing the wage gap is actually really good for the economy because women control a lot of spending, uh, influence a lot of spending. And when women have more money to spend, they actually invest it back into the community at higher rates than men do. So actually getting more money for yourself is good for your family. It's good for your community. It's good for the economy. It's just, you know, net positive. And we look at those pieces of data in the automotive industry, too, to say, you know, women are responsible for 65% of all car purchases. We do over 70% of all the car maintenance. And so, yeah, women have, we have the purchasing power in this country. We're just not necessarily getting the income that we need to spend that and, and push the economy forward. Um, you know, one thing you said earlier that I totally agree with and I love is that women tend to approach negotiating as a problem solving. Let's get together and figure out how we can come to a solution versus, you know, men, especially when they're negotiating for cars, you know, we, we refer to car buying as the game and they look at as they're trying to win. They're trying to beat the dealer as if there's a winner and a loser, whereas women tend to look for how can we create a win-win situation? And, you know, that's certainly how I've built my entire business model. And, you know, I just find that interesting that that men have that win-lose versus women have that win-win mentality. Well, it's interesting that you brought that up because... In negotiations with people, you're going to have an ongoing relationship with people you're going to continue to work with or for, or you want to do business with. Actually, the win-win approach is superior. It's better for long-term working relationships. It's better for business. It is the superior approach. So in negotiation training classes, we say the goal is to get everybody to negotiate like a woman because women's natural, comfortable approach let me hear what's going on with you. What are your problems? What are your constraints? What are your goals? This is what's uh, what I'm dealing with actually produces better agreements because everybody understands each other. They can be more creative about the solutions and come out with good agreements. 
But in a one-off negotiation, like a car buying situation, the win-lose approach, the I'm going to get more, you're going to get less, actually is the appropriate approach. If you are just negotiating about money, it's zero sum. You spend more, they get more, you get less, you know, they get more, you get, you know, whatever. Um, There's basically, you know, a finite pot of money and however much you give up, you know, that's what they get. So that more male approach is better suited to a car purchasing situation. And that's one reason that women find it uncomfortable. That's not a, a type of approach that we have been conditioned to feel, feel, you know, is acceptable, tolerable, and comfortable. Right. And most people, you know, buy a car every, some people do it every three or four years, but the average right now is almost 11 years. So, you know, why do you care about how the car you know, salesperson feels, you know, obviously they're trying to make money and and feed their own families, but you know, they're in the sales game. This is a negotiable product for me and my business. It's, it's very different because I have that long-term relationship, but I also bring the leverage to the table of, you know, I'm going to buy 20 cars in one month. And the dealers that are smart are looking at that as a strategic relationship. So I can still get the bottom line dollar amount that you would get using the, let's call it the, the man strategy of negotiating, but it still creates that woman side win-win because it is a long-term relationship. So, you know, it kind of creates the best of both worlds. The customer gets that bottom line, one-time negotiated deal. The dealer gets a relationship to where they may get the majority of my business if they consistently bring the deals and the relationship to the table because they've got to compete on customer service as well as the money. Right, right. Well, thank you so much, Sara, for sharing your insights. And I'm going to put a link to both of Sara's books, Women Don't Ask and Ask For It. I'll put those links into the description of this podcast. So if you want to check these books out, they're really amazing. I actually haven't read the second one yet, but I'm going to go out and buy it this afternoon and read that this weekend. We just, as women, we have to stand up for ourselves and know when, you know, it's just about the numbers and to disconnect the emotions and when the relationship is important and work to create that win-win, but we've got to value ourselves. And I think that's where really the underlying challenge is for us. Sounds right to me. Uh, Good luck, everybody. You can do this. It's not rocket science. It's a skill. And, you know, if you practice, you'll get better at it. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Sarah. And folks, if you still, you know, if you want to get better at negotiating, great. But if buying a car is still just a bigger pain in the butt and time suck than you want to deal with, you know, reach out to me at www.thecarchick.com and I can still handle it all for you. Until next time, folks, drive safely. We're out of here. The Straight Shift Podcast is copyright Leanne Shattuck, The Car Chick, 2017. All views expressed by guest and or co-hosts are those of the guest and or co-hosts, and not necessarily those of Leanne Shattuck or The Car Chick.